we could put some of these policy solutions in place, if we could fill some of the challenges that we have in here in Connecticut or address some of the challenges, we'll be able to return Connecticut back to top half of the country, top third of the country in some of our economic outputs. And that's, I think that's what we all want. I mean, we just, we all love this state. We just want to see it realize its true potential. Or as we say, we want to unlock Connecticut's true economic potential. Just a quick reminder for you to like, subscribe, and rate this podcast so we can get your feedback and know how to make it better. Hey, it's Ari. Welcome to another episode of the Made in America podcast. Today, I'm with Chris DiPentima, president and CEO of CBIA. Hey, Chris, how's it going? Good to be with you, Ari. <laughs> Always a pleasure, my friend. Listen, really happy to have you on. Uh, obviously, not obviously you're a veteran of the podcast, uh, but I think a really important voice that we have on, you know, over and over again. Started your first uh, podcast episode, I think, in the manufacturing space, and now uh, here we are coming back for I think the third time as uh, the leader of CBIA, which is the state's biggest business uh, association. What's really important I want to talk about today was two years ago, you launched the Rebuild Connecticut plan, which I think from my time was a really innovative way to think about how to engage the legislature and really the state and how we can think about solutions and activities to help build Connecticut's economy stronger. And obviously in Rebuild, talking about maybe fixing some things, you just launched in September of last year, Transform Connecticut, which is sort of CBIA's next on a strategic plan or what have you, maybe you can probably better describe it, but sort of the next stage to move beyond sort of where that rebuild was. I think it's really important for manufacturers to understand where the economy is going in Connecticut. Obviously, given your background, you've got some particular uh, traction in the manufacturing space, uh, but with the economy overall. So I wonder if maybe you could just walk us through Transform Connecticut, why it's so important and, and what are the tenants? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks again for having me on. And the, the policy strategy, as you mentioned, is exactly that. It's a two-year strategy for us because our legislators are elected for two-year periods of time. And uh, in Rebuild Connecticut was the first time CBIA had really offered a policy pledge to our legislators, something for them to sign on to during the campaign season to get behind or not get behind, you know, <laughs> choose one way or another. <laughs> and, uh, and prior to that, CBIA had done endorsements of specific individuals in order to show that they either supported the business community or not. And we felt that the pledge was even a better way. It was putting solutions before these candidates while they were in their campaigning season. A small set of solutions, Rebuild had about 10, Transform Connecticut has 12 policy solution recommendations. And for them to put their pen on, if you will, their signature on, to show their support of the Connecticut business community, including our great manufacturers. And the other great thing about it is it's for us, then becomes our priorities for the legislative session, it's a way to hold our elected official accountable because we could say, you signed this back in the fall, you really believed in it, you showed that you supported the business community. Now let's put your words into action and get these things into legislation. Money where your mouth is. Money where your mouth is. You know, walk the talk, right? We always talk about. And then the third piece of it for us, the three-legged stool, is at the end of session, it becomes our scorecard at CBI. It becomes the legislative scorecard for our elected officials, whether they signed on to the pledge or not. We rank how these, uh, if these bills were raised, did they get passed, did they support them? And for CBIA, it's an accountability tool. Did we get these things through at the end of session? You and I have talked a lot in the past about accountability, metrics, transparency, and these policy solutions do all that. And so now here we are in our phase two, our second time doing this, and we've moved from rebuilding the state because of the pandemic and the devastation that it caused to we want to move the state to the next level now, truly transform Connecticut. And that's what these policy solutions uh, that we've recommended, we believe will do if, if put into place. They will start to move Connecticut to the next level, getting our economy back to the top half of the country, getting people fully engaged in work and getting our businesses to realize their true economic output. So kind of leading into this, I know, you know, if you looked at sort of the Connecticut relative ranking across the country, you know, you look back maybe a year or so ago, uh, it was looking like we were moving very quickly in the right direction. It seems like we've taken a little bit of a, a slide back. I wonder if, if you've seen that and, and what your thoughts are around how this helps us move back towards like the top half, like you talked about. Yeah, I, I don't think it's so much that we've slid back as a state. It's that a lot of other states have caught up to us. You said during the pandemic, Connecticut responded incredibly. The, the governor, I think, and the administration and our legislative leaders did a great job responding to the pandemic. 
The business community was phenomenal. Our manufacturers figured out a way to continue to work because they were allowed to stay open, but keep people safe and healthy in doing that. And early on, it was wild, wild west, plexiglass <laughs> going up, and then it was six foot separation, and then masks came in, and then then the vaccination, uh, the vaccine came available, and, and we were one of the first states to get to 70% vaccinated and 80% vaccinated. We were one of the first states in the country to fully reopen in May of 2021. I remember being interviewed by the BBC when I was inside of CBIA, and they were asking us what we thought it was going to be like when our state fully reopened, because we weren't just the full, first state to fully reopen. We were one of the first places in the whole world to fully reopen from the pandemic. So we responded incredibly. And as a result, our economic metrics responded accordingly. And we were top in the country when it came to economic output. We were top in the country when it came to getting people back to work. But since then, it's been, we're, we will be entering our fourth year post-COVID this March, if you think about it. I know, yeah, it's a little bit of a shocker when I tell people that, but we're coming to the end of year three COVID. Yeah. I don't know when we ever yeah, stop exactly. talking about it. It's a little bit like a BC and an <laughs> AD. Um, but now, you know, it's been a little while, the vaccine's been out, and it's not so much that we've slid as a state, but the other states in the country have have caught up to where we are. You know, they're as vaccinated as we are, they're reopened as we are. And because they didn't have some of the issues we had pre-COVID, like population growth really struggling, workforce challenges that we had even pre-COVID, their economies have generated a higher output than we have. Um, and so now, if we could put some of these policy solutions in place, if we could fill some of the challenges that we have in here in Connecticut or address some of the challenges, we'll be able to return Connecticut back to top half of the country, top third of the country in some of our economic outputs. And that's, I think that's what we all want. I mean, we just, we all love this state. We just want to see it realize its true potential. Or as we say, we want to unlock Connecticut's true economic potential. Yeah. Well, listen, I couldn't possibly agree with you more. I love that frame up of it. And I think when I look at the transform kind of Connecticut, you know, platform, you know, it seems like we've got sort of three big pillars that all those sort of 12 policy provisions sort of fall into. And I wonder if we can maybe connect back those big pillars to how you think those are going to help us drive to those results, you know, top half to top, you know, top quartile uh, of the, in the entire country. And so, you know, I look at the buckets, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I sort of see like a workforce bucket, a little bit of sort of cost of doing business bucket, and then something that maybe you'd look at as like investments in the future or something along those lines. Those are the right ways to think about it. And, and maybe you could think about, maybe we start, if, you, if they are, let's pick one and sort of talk about what we're doing in that to, to kind of move the state forward. Yeah, th those are definitely the, the three right buckets um, that the 12 solutions kind of fall under. And I'll start with the easiest one. It's something that CBI has been doing for 200 and now eight years, because <laughs> CBI started in 1815, um, is the cost of doing business, making the state easier to do business, making it a little more affordable to do business. And, and those are just classic policies that CBI has always advocated for, right? Our legislators Literally, like didn't we find an article? I think you and I were talking one time. There was like some article from the Hartford Current from like 1847 talking about taxes were too high on like cows or something. I mean, yeah. just like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right? So, uh, I've done that. It's just like, it just makes the state easier to do business, make it more affordable to do business, lower our taxes. And right. that's, that's classic CBI. And, you know, I think CBI will always do that. They'll always focus on where can we make the state a little less expensive for our businesses in order to drive that business investment, which then drives economic growth at sure. a regional level and a state level. And so in the Transform Pledge, we've got things that are specific to uh, you know helping those businesses. Primarily this year, we focus on the small businesses. They're the ones that have struggled from the pandemic to fully recover and get back to where there. We lost a lot of our small businesses. Like when you, what's the definition? I mean, everyone has a different definition. Yeah. Like when you think about small business, what's what's that? What's the box? At CBI, we define it as 100 employees and less. Most people think of CBI as representing the big businesses in the, in the state. Ironically, other people think of CBI as representing the small businesses, <laughs> and it's both. You know, our membership includes all of our blue chip companies in the state, and the electric boats, and the travelers, and the Hartford, the Medtronic, Sikorsky, Command, Pratt & Whitney. No doubt those blue chips are all in our membership and we have great relations with, with them. But when you look at CBI's membership demographics, 95% of our membership is 100 employees or less. 87% of our membership is 50 employees or less. And about 75% of our membership is 25 employee and less companies. And that's the demographics of Connecticut businesses. People mm -hmm. sometimes don't realize that the average size business in Connecticut, the average size manufacturer in Connecticut is about 25 people. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we say small business, we're talking 100 employees or less. We're primarily talking about pass-through entities. 
You know, our bigger businesses are generally C corps. Our smaller businesses are S corps, LLCs, sole proprietorships, and partnerships. So when we talk about making the state more affordable for for those businesses, we're talking about taking some of the tax credits that our bigger C corp companies could get, and let's let those smaller uh, pastor entities take advantage of them as well. The research and development tax credit. It's had tremendous impact for our big businesses who can take advantage of it because it's only eligible for our C-Corps. And we've advocated for a number of years now, let's make our small businesses, our pass-through eligible for the research and development tax credit. Our statistics in Connecticut have shown that the companies that take advantage of it generally invest about two and a half dollars for every one dollar in tax credit they're getting. So you're getting private sector match and it generates about 2,000 jobs every year. So if we could get that to our small businesses, which we have many more past entities and small businesses in Connecticut than C-Corps, that can drive a general economic growth for our state. The other great thing is, you know, from a manufacturing point of view, when you're incentivizing our manufacturers, especially our small ones, to invest in research and development, which includes sometimes equipment, improving their processes, their roots get deeper. Mm -hmm. And if we could get our roots of our businesses deeper in our state, it's not easy to get up and leave necessarily. You know, they want to then grow in here and they the roots get, get more deeper. invested. You get invested in your community, which then makes the which makes the you know sort of the um, not, it, you know sort of makes the the lifestyle and the like the way life living experience in Connecticut that much better. You get deeper communities, improves the education. I mean, right? I mean, just so, it sort of starts that positive cycle. A beautiful forward. cycle that happens. Yeah, and the great yeah. thing in manufacturing, the other thing that happens is. For every one manufacturing job we create, we create five other ancillary jobs because our manufacturers have a tendency to buy local, spend local. Mm -hmm. So, and this isn't just you know other jobs in the supply chain, which it, it clearly they create both the direct supply chain. I'll buy my materials local, but I'll also hire my attorney local, my sure. account local. But they also have a tendency to spend local at the restaurants or at the retailers or at the dry cleaners, and so that just creates a great economic growth for Connecticut. And I know that's why DCD and Paul Lavoie have been very focused on. How do we grow advanced manufacturing in Connecticut? Because the, the multiplier effect that they have is, is greater than any other industry sector that we have in Connecticut and greater than most states have in any industry sector. Yeah, no, that's a hundred percent. And I, I think the other piece that's maybe sometimes lost too is, you know, R and D is what leads companies to be leaders in the future. And so, if you're in a manufacturer that's just, that's just starting up, and, and people don't know that there's manufacturers that have started recently, but there are plenty of them, and some that have gotten big fast. Athletic Brewing, I think of one that you know we've interviewed recently that's grown, you know, sort of gangbusters. Having an opportunity for those folks to have R and D tax credits here to invest to grow the business deeper roots and have an opportunity to take those small businesses and eventually make them new big businesses, right? Because ultimately that's the idea. Let's add to our stack of blue chips. You know, it's hard to get blue chip companies to move. It's great to grow them here. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the best way to do it. Incentivize that investment, those processes, improvements. And we've got a lot of companies that currently doing a lot of R&D. They're, they're getting the federal tax credit. Let's give them some incentive on the state side and let's make Connecticut competitive on that. And everyone Connecticut. that's signed off on this pledge, you're saying essentially is inherently saying, yeah, we support this. This, this, investment. this investment. Yeah. And the great thing for us this year, and we'll talk about it further, is we have nearly half the legislators sign on to the pledge this year, which is tremendous. That's great. Yeah. We're very excited about that. And the bipartisan group, uh, you know, about 44 uh, Republicans and 39 Democrats signed on to the pledge, 45% of the legislator. And that that commitment. We even had some folks sign on after election, which if wow. you think about it, it was like, well, why, why am I signing on? Why do you sign on now? You've already been elected. You know, you don't have to go out and campaign on this. They truly believe that these were solutions that were important to them that were going to move our state forward. So to have a bipartisan, good working group behind it, um, it is going to be tremendous. And many of them are in leadership positions in the House or Senate or on committee chairs. And so uh, that's going to really help us get it enacted when it, when it comes time to actually, you know, walk the talk. Yeah, no doubt. Listen, I, I want to switch back to some of these pillars, but since you brought up, I'll ask a couple of questions. I think the sort of stigma around CBIA has been that it's really a Republican group, but you just laid the numbers. I don't remember them exactly. 45, 39, I think is what you said. It's just about 50, 50. Do you think, is it important to you to, to be recognized as a, as a, as a bipartisan group? Yeah, we're a nonpartisan nonprofit, and it's important that we be recognized like that. I agree. I agree with you. The stigma in years past has been CBI is right leaning, the Republican favoritism, they're Hartford centric. These solutions are bipartisan, moderate solutions, 
no home runs, singles and doubles, move our state forward, move our state forward year after year. You've talked about it, how sometimes people get frustrated when they see a hundred steps in front of them and they're like, ah, that's a long way to go, but take one step at a time today and another step tomorrow. And that's what these solutions are doing. Let's, we can take some nice steps over the last couple of years. Let's take some more steps over the next two years with this legislative group that we have and continue to move our state forward economically. But it's critical that it be a bipartisan group. If, if the Republicans were in the majority, I wouldn't want all Republicans signing on to the campaign either. It's got to be the folks who represent the majority of people who live in our state, our common residents. And I believe our common residents are pretty much that moderate group of folks, fiscally conservative, maybe a little more socially moderate or liberal, who want to see our state move forward. Yeah, man, you, we, you're seeing my language, so I'd love to hear that for sure. So let's kind of pivot back to the, the pillars. You, you talked about investments. What about cost of business? Like, what are you guys thinking about in the pledge? Talk about what, what you're thinking for solutions to the cost of business. Yeah, I mean, there's a cost couple of things. doing business. The cost really of doing is. business. Yeah. yeah, in addition to the R and D tax credit, there's another tax credit that we're advocating for. For again, our small businesses, our path entities, who apply to all of our manufacturers. And what happened a few years ago is we have a path entity tax credit. And it allows businesses to take a tax credit up to a certain amount. When the state was having some fiscal challenges in 17 and 18, the state reduced that tax credit from 93% down to 87%. We're advocating now that our fiscal health is back where it should be. Let's give that money back to our small businesses. Let's get them that incentive to take that full tax credit again, which is a 93% tax credit. It's a complicated issue. It was put in place because of uh, you know Trump and the whole yeah, salt, the salt cap. tax. Yeah. Yeah. But let's give those businesses back You know what they were you know, given back in 2016 before the state had, you know, the state was having some challenges then, but before we had to take it away from them in order to balance our budget. That's one of the other things. Another thing we're advocating for is fully funding the unemployment trust fund. We've talked about this before. The unemployment trust is paid for by our businesses. It's not paid for by the state. It's not paid for by the federal government. And when we had a massive amount of unemployment during COVID, we had to borrow money from the federal government to keep it solvent so that people who were on unemployment could get paid. Well, the businesses pay back that debt, not the state. The state has used some COVID dollars to pay back uh, the monies owed from the government, but we still owe a couple hundred million dollars. And what will happen is if we don't pay that money back, the states, uh, the businesses will get an assessment this coming September and each year after that until that money is paid back. So why penalize our businesses? I mean, a lot of them had to lay off people because we were shut down. They weren't allowed to stay open. So why penalize them and make them pay that money back to the federal government when we as a state have enough of a fiscal surplus, we could afford to pay it and give those businesses some predictability, stability, and confidence that the state won't be looking for them to pay for that in the future. And so we've advocated fully uh, paying back the unemployment trust fund. We're, there's only two states in the country, can I get one of two, who haven't fully paid back their UI trust fund. In fact, some states have actually overfunded their trust fund thinking that, hey, maybe there's a recession on the horizon and we want you businesses to be very confident that you won't have to go through another bump in the road with these trust funds. And so states like New Hampshire have actually overfunded uh, their trust fund. And we're just looking for the state to get it back to a solvency point of view. Yeah, listen, I think that's a really important issue. I'm just going to reiterate what you've said, uh, which I think is just a repeat, but just in case, it's just to say, like, I don't think people do understand that unemployment is just a tax assessed on businesses that the government holds on to, right? So you pay a percentage on top of payroll that goes into the unemployment fund that gets paid. And when there's a big unemployment issue like we had in COVID, they got to sort of run a deficit on that fund, i.e. there's money that wasn't there. And so we borrow it from the feds. And if it doesn't get paid back timely, there's this extra assessment that effectively means businesses have to pay extra percentages on top of payroll, which is like really regressive and something that was here to benefit the residents of Connecticut. And with the money we got from the government for COVID, doesn't seem like a tall ask to say, hey, can we use some of that money to keep this thing from getting out of control? No, absolutely. Unfortunately for, I think sometimes our policymakers, it's just not as sexy as maybe funding a program or something like that, uh, because a lot of people still don't understand how the unemployment trust fund works. But if we could do it, it's, it's not that big a deal. It's not a huge fiscal note, but it means a lot to our businesses. Right. Yeah, no doubt about it. And it's something that you, as a business owner, you are, I am, you know, you see that. Like, that's something that comes across your desk, and it's just another little, like, kind of knock that we'd like to like to get off of. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, so I want to move to workforce, because, I, I mean, investment's important, reducing the cost of business, and obviously we talked about the importance of the unemployment stuff. That's great. But I, I think 
you know, from what I'm hearing, certainly on the manufacturing side, and not just there, but absolutely there as much as anywhere, is this workforce challenge. I mean, I, I think I was reading in, well, I've seen it many, many places, but I think even in sort of this uh, document that uh, sort of talked about the Transform Connecticut pledge, it really talked about 83 or 84% of, of Connecticut businesses talk about having a challenge filling open positions. So I want to start with sort of something that I, we've talked about personally, you know, a number of times, but sort of bring it here, which is, yeah, I think there was an idea that, hey, one of the ways to solve the Connecticut population crisis was have more jobs in Connecticut, right? Because for a while, it was like we didn't really have a job engine growing. So I think there was a thought process that, hey, if we had jobs, we've got this, we've got this great quality of life, we'll just like fill it with people. Well, we've created the jobs, but somehow we're, we're not really there yet. Um, so I just, you know, what's your, what are you guys thinking about that? How are we solving that? How are we thinking about solving that problem? Yeah, the, the workforce crisis is huge for our manufacturers. It's, it's actually across every industry sector in Connecticut since the pandemic. It, and it's actually at every kind of skill set level, entry level to the most advanced. And you kind of hit the nail on the head. Back in the day, I think we thought in Connecticut- Around with, 2010, yeah, 11, yeah, 12, yeah. Post 08, 09 yeah, recession. Post that recession, yeah. As we recovered, uh, the state was having some financial challenges with you know budget deficits and tax hikes, budget deficits and tax hikes. And what happened is, you know, some businesses, I think, fled the state. And as a result, we as a state said, wow, if we could create some jobs, I think we'll get some people to come. Because they saw that the businesses were leaving with the jobs and the people went with the businesses as well. Either actually went with the businesses or just left Connecticut to go to a state that was growing in their economy. And so we thought, let's just create the jobs and the people will come. And we had a hard time kind of recovering from the 08 09, 09 recession. Our manufacturers were actually looking for people pre-COVID mm -hmm. and challenge. Some of the challenge also was, though, the, the skill set. And, and yeah, manufacturing, I think, yeah, had a unique sort of challenge, right? I mean, there yeah. wasn't, it was like we, we went a whole generation almost of telling people don't go to manufacturing. So there was a bit of a unique stigma there. Yeah. And we stopped investing Correct. in the curriculum to develop mm -hmm. those people. And so we needed to get those pipelines going. And so that was, that was really also holding us back. Fast forward, the pandemic happens, we come out of it, and we still kind of have this mindset, well, geez, if we had created the jobs, the people would come. And then the demand comes and the businesses go out and do what they always do in Connecticut because they're always the best businesses in the world. And they secure demand for their products and services, which is amazing at a troubling time. And they're seeing all of a sudden record demand and the ability to have record revenues and pay a record <laughs> amount of taxes to the state and help our, you know, help our economy. But they didn't have the people. And, you know, we went as high as 120, 130,000 job openings That's in the state crazy. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just, it's a, uh, I mean, like in 2012, if you were like, Hey, we're going to have 120,000 job openings, right? You would never, wouldn't have believed it. They, they would have, everyone would have been like, Oh, we're on the right path. Okay. We'll fill <laughs> exactly. those job openings. And since September of 2021, which is when the federal unemployment additional subsidy went away to today, we bounced between about 97,000 job openings and 125,000. Some months we go down some months, but we've been right in that range. And so we've, we've secured the demand for our products and services our businesses have, but we just have not been able to fill these jobs. And each month we add two or three or four or 5,000 jobs to, you know, people working to Connecticut, but the job number doesn't change much at all. And our labor participation number is actually pretty good. We're 16th in the country when it comes to labor participation, which means of those people who are work eligible, a good chunk of them are working. Our unemployment's you know just below four percent, so it's not like a huge number of unemployed people. And in fact, I use a stat a lot. If every unemployed person got a job, if we had zero percent unemployment, we'd still have almost forty thousand job openings. We just wouldn't be able to fill forty percent of our open jobs. So it comes back to why is that? Why we've got we did what we were supposed to do. We got the demand. Our unemployment isn't too high. We've got good participation rate. Why are we not filling these jobs? And if you peel back the onion and, and look at do true root cause analysis, it's the lack of population growth. We just didn't grow our state from a population basis. And as a result, we didn't grow our workforce during from 08, 09 to 2020. We had a spike in population growth during the pandemic. We had about 60,000 people move to our state in 2021 because they wanted that rural area, quality of life, our education system is second to none. Um, but last year in 2022, it slowed down. We only added 2,800 people to the state, about 0.08 percent, you know, negligible population yeah. growth. Um, and that's why in our workforce solutions, there's a lot of stuff folks will see in there that are really focused on growing the population. 
We could do more training, and there's some great training programs going on. Career Connect with Kelly Marie Valeris and the Office of Workforce Strategy has been launched, about $100 million investments on training programs, regional to get people involved and get them upskilled to be able to fill some of these jobs. But again, we need more people in the state of Connecticut, and there's a lot of things we could do to make Connecticut more attractive, either from a cost point of view or a regulation point of view, to draw and attract people to the state to grow our population. That's, uh, yeah, look, that's an, so let, let's dig into that a little bit. Obviously, that's the huge issue. And like, if I look at one of the options we talked about, or you've talked about in the pledge here is, is about housing. So it, when you talk about root cause analysis, manufacturers know that well. If you talk about sort of root cause analysis, you're sort of saying, hey, one of the challenges is people don't have a place to live and therefore they need, is that is that the challenge here? Yeah, well, or if you're going to come to Connecticut, it's just your, the cost of housing is very expensive. I'm going to single family on a piece of property, everything we all want when we can afford it, which is maybe not being until our 40s or 50s if we're fortunate enough. But if you're a young person looking to move to Connecticut or just graduated one of our great systems, either public high school or our college systems here, and you look to go get your first house or lease your first apartment, we just don't have enough of it. And as a result, you know, it's been good for all of us who own houses during the pandemic. The price has finally gone up after 10 years of probably not moving. The bad news is just there's not enough affordable inventory. And when people hear that CBIA is proposing things around housing and immigration and student debt, they're going, hold on a second. This is the business organization of Connecticut? Yeah, it's the business organization of Connecticut because we have now discovered over the last two years we could have all the demand we want and all the jobs we want. We need the people to fill them and truly to unlock Connecticut's economic potential. So our housing proposal is to incentivize our developers in our towns, cities, especially our urban areas, to work together to convert some of our brownfields, our blighted commercial properties that maybe at one day were a manufacturing property, but no longer are today, to make housing more housing there, what we call worker housing or opportunity housing. Because a lot of those areas are near public transportation. And then that worker who moves to Connecticut or that student who graduates and stays in Connecticut can then access a job nearby, hopefully, because they're close to public transportation. So trying to get to more of that sort of work, live, play, make it a little bit easier type. And so and so the idea is putting them on the – and so the specific proposal is around brownfield conversion to housing and and sort of incentivizing that? Yeah, and you know, the blighted properties. And, and the incentive would be tax abatements, tax credits at the city level, the town level, supported and funded by the state to get the developers there. And certainly use a carrot approach. I think there's been a lot of talk about affordable housing in Connecticut – from policymakers or people hoping to become a policymaker. And it's been a bit of a stick approach. You know, let's penalize our towns if they don't have this much affordable housing. We're saying, let's use a carrot approach, right? Because some folks want local control. We need local, we're Connecticut, we're 169 different towns and fiefdoms. Everyone likes to do things 169 different ways. This is one of the challenges of not having counties uh, like some states have. So we're saying, let's put a carrot out there, incentivize our builders and towns to work together. This solution actually was developed in concert with the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities, which is an association that represents all our towns and cities across Connecticut, and also another nonprofit called Desegregate Connecticut, who is focused on creating more affordable housing in Connecticut. They've tried a couple of things over the last couple of years. They weren't so successful, more of the stick approach. And we worked with them this year to say, why don't we try the carrot approach, work with us, and see if we could work together and make it more effective. So this is three organizations. We've got more folks joining that coalition to sign on to this pledge, uh, this specific solution to uh, to move it forward for housing. It's a could, pretty inter some pretty interesting bedfellows right there. You got If you want to get things good. done, you've got to collaborate in order to drive that innovation. No, it's really good. I, and I wonder, you know, something that really I don't think was called out specifically, but something that you hear about from, a, you know, when you think about sort of attracting and retaining, especially the people that are graduating from schools, is sort of the lack of like consistent urban core. I mean, Stanford's done a lot. So let, let's be clear about that. I think New Haven's made some progress, a lot less so uh, in Danbury, Hartford and Waterbury. Um, and I wonder, was it kind of on here specifically, but is it something that you think about? And, and is the reason that we're sort of incentivizing brownfield remediation is that a lot of those brownfields and sort of like the, a lot of that, you know, hard to reconfigure urban core is in some of those cities that I mentioned that are struggling. Yeah, absolutely. And those are the cities that we've got to you know, we've got to lift up. It's one thing if you're Stanford's moving up, but you need all tides to rise all boats. And Hartford right now has, last I saw just a couple of days ago, about 2.8 million 
square feet of empty commercial real estate. You know, can we start converting some of these commercial real estate as well as the blighted properties to residential? On the occupancy side, Hartford's done a great job on the residential. 95% occupancy rate when it comes to residential. On the commercial side, you know, it's 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 dropping down more and more every day as businesses downsize. But yeah, our focus on brownfields and the blighted commercial property has been in our cities. And as I also said, that also helps with people who are moving to Connecticut for the first time or staying in Connecticut if they're graduating because generally you're on a public transportation line, right? So maybe you can't afford a car. It's your first job. So you're looking for your to rent your first apartment. You've got to be probably in those urban areas that have a little better access to public transportation than some of our rural areas do. Sure. And plus also have some stuff to do that you also don't have yeah. to drive to. It doesn't, doesn't hurt. doesn't oh. hurt either. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if we're going to have time to get into it, but I mean, that, that challenge of of emptying office space is just a, I mean, as I'm sure you're well aware, is a national challenge. I was just, uh, actually, was just talking to someone the other day. I guess San Francisco's like down to uh, 26% vacancy, wow. um, uh, which is like, I don't know, 20 something million square feet or whatever, as just these companies kind of rethink you know, how they're doing it. So probably a topic for a whole other show is how we kind of think about, about the new uh, work. But, um, and then I mean, what else about workforce do you think is really critical for, for people to be thinking about? So we talked about housing, you t- mentioned immigration or you sort of touched on it. Um, interesting to wonder how that's been going around in the legislature. Uh, cer- certainly a third rail on the national scene, but, but what, you know, what are we thinking about immigration? And, and you, I think you had said uh, earlier on making Connecticut the most the number one immigrant from the state hey, in the country. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Differentiate Talk ourselves from our, our yeah. counterparts right across the country. And again, I know people see that this is CBIA talking about <laughs> immigration. Yes. We need people in the state, grow the economy, fill our jobs. When we talk about immigration, unfortunately at a national level, there's not much we could do. We got cap on, on H1B visas. And so unless you're coming from a refugee company, a, a country, we, we really are capped on the immigrants that we could bring in. But of those coming into the country, there is ways to work around some of that. And one of the the things that's been explored is if you're on a college campus and you have businesses on those college campus, what people sometimes call co-oping, it doesn't have to be your main business, but a satellite office, there's ways to get around some of those immigration caps. And so we've proposed in there that UConn specifically take the charge of looking at how our colleges and businesses can work together um, to work around that immigration cap and then make Connecticut a more desirable and and by making it more affordable and more desirable, really lead the country when it comes to getting its fair share of immigrants coming into the state. How does UConn feel about that? Uh, UConn's done a lot of the studies, so they're feeling good about it. And you know, I think it's just a matter of you know getting the business partners with them and looking at it. University of Bridgeport educates a lot of immigrants, and at least they did pre-pandemic, and they're back now. And they've started to have some businesses located on their campus. And so I think if we could take a look at where UB had been done is doing, now Goodwin has taken over University of Bridgeport, which is great because our manufacturers know Goodwin very well. And Goodwin is is really good about doing things quickly and, yes. and, and the right things in order yep. to grow and working with UConn <laughs> to see, okay, what can we do at our state to, to give Connecticut an edge, to position us above other states so that we can get the most immigrants possible moving into our state. Because a lot of, you know, Back in the day when we were the heyday of manufacturers, there were people coming from Poland from here, South America from here. You know, that's where a lot of our workforce came. Um, this isn't, you know, hey, let's bring in immigrants. They're going to take away our American job. No, this is, we've got plenty of jobs for everybody. And we need population growth in the state of Connecticut. And immigration is a way of, of really growing the, the state's population. Yeah, listen, if you ever go back and if you ever go down to like the Colt factory or take a tour or do any reading and you just find out like all the different places that they had people from, they built worker housing and tried to have things that reminded them of the old country of where they came from. So uh, truly a land built uh, on, on immigrants. I mean, what are you hearing about that kind of immigration concept? I mean, for the one thing, UConn, just as you were talking, I think, think, was thinking to myself, makes a lot of sense, right? Because they've got a Hartford campus, they got a Stanford campus, I think there's like a Waterbury campus. So they've got sort of campus, not just, you wouldn't have to, everyone doesn't have to be in stores, right? You've got right. some more, you got some stuff around the state. Are you getting support from that? I mean, what do you hear from the legislator, uh, legislature and, and uh, obviously from UConn and whoever else on on actually executing to that? Yeah, the, the legislator wants to look at anything possible to grow the population. I think, like I said, the fact that we've got so many folks to sign on to the pledge means we we all have alignment on what the challenges are. 
And now we've got alignment on potentially what the solutions are, and then it's just implementing them. So we talked, you know, very closely with UConn when developing this this solution around, okay, what can we do to grow immigration? We talked with immigration attorneys. We had an immigration panel at one of our economic conferences. We really explored the immigration topic, and we said, okay, what is what is a federal issue that maybe we won't be able to solve little old Connecticut, and what can we do at a state level to put better practices and procedures in place to grow the immigrant population. And that's where this solution came out of. So I, I think there's things that be done. It, it's going to take a little bit because we're going to have to understand the concept better. And that's really what this solution is, is to kind of do a study. I'm not a big fan of studies or committees, but we've got to understand what investments need to be made, who needs to be at the table in order for us to position ourselves higher than other states on the immigration side. But it, it's a real opportunity. I mean, we'll continue to look at the immigration issue. What else can we do in Connecticut uh, to make us more immigrant friendly? There's no doubt about it. Just last piece on the workforce, and then we've got to wrap it up. But, you know, this workforce challenge, you know, I, I do business in a number of states now and, and travel a bit more. This really isn't a Connecticut problem. It isn't a New England problem. And you were talking earlier, you sort of said it was a global problem. So I wonder your perspective on on that and how hard is it going to be for us to, or let me say it differently, what can we do differently to stand out to solve the problem in the face of everybody trying to sort of solve the same problem? Yeah, it, it is a global issue. I mean, I still talk to my counterparts from my, my old <laughs> job when I ran locations in France and you know, other parts of the country. And the workforce issue is still a challenge over in, in Europe as well. And we were talking earlier, you know, China is just opening up from the from the pandemic, so I'm sure Asia is struggling with that challenge. I mean, the things we can do differently in Connecticut, you know I'm a big fan of collaboration. We've talked about some of these solutions as not just CBIA, but it's organizations coming together. It's collaborating to understand how can we position ourselves as a state. We've got some incredible foundation that's already been laid with quality of life and education. We've, we've continued to bring down the cost of living. There was a great tax package passed last year okay, what more can we do? And I think if we bring different groups to the table, maybe bedfellows who weren't normal bedfellows, that's when those great innovative ideas come to mind around immigration or around housing, or we've got another one around student debt. We've got to come together to think about how can we position Connecticut differently than other states, because everyone's trying to solve this workforce crisis. Some states are maybe a little more fortunate and they've had population growth. So they've got more people sitting on the sidelines and they just got to tap them and things like maybe a sign on bonus is what ignites them or richer benefits. And I know all our manufacturers and all our businesses are struggling with how do I differentiate myself between my other businesses in Connecticut offering different type of benefits or, or bonuses or, or higher wages. But as, when we look at it at a state level, how do we differentiate ourselves against other states? What innovative ideas can we come up with? And that's why we look at cost of living, cost of doing business, growing the population in Connecticut. And if we continue to talk to each other, different groups talking to each other, I think that's how we're going to differentiate. Because we've got some of the most innovative people in the world living right here and working right here in our state. Yeah, there's no question. I mean, you constantly see us on the list of like, uh, you know, uh, patents per person. I mean, even continues uh, day after day. And we've got some amazing companies doing some amazing things. Um, yeah, so that's that. So listen, as we're just sort of wrapping up, I, I think it's really interesting. I take a step back and think about when you were just getting going at CBIA and the things to me about walking the walk, thinking about ideas of simplifying the message, being solution oriented, being collaborative, working with people that maybe CBIA didn't work with in the past, converting from an organization that was really about, was maybe deemed a little bit questionably too political and too one-sided that sort of moved more middle of the road. seems like we've made a ton of progress in a lot of all those areas. You feeling good about where you're at? Yeah. Yeah. I'm feeling good about where we are and where the state is. Our our fiscal health hasn't probably never been better. You know, we've got a rainy day fund of 3.3 billion, a budget surplus of 2.8 billion. We can make these investments that we're recommending Paying here. Paying down the long-term debt. Let's huge, not forget that. Huge, That's which huge, which has freed up cash yeah. on the operational side, again, to make <laughs> investments like this. Um, the number of people supporting these solutions, you know, the, the, there's clear metrics out there that, you know, CBIA is doing things differently. We're all doing things differently. Uh, the state's gotten itself into a good place through the pandemic. Now it's, as we said, now it's transforming. Now it's taking the state to the next level. What investments do we make, which will have that ROI to trigger the economy and that cause that cycle that we talked about? And, that's why we were very focused. We did a lot of interviews, over 100 interviews. We surveyed thousands of businesses. 
It, what, these aren't CBIA staff ideas. These are the business community's ideas. And we boil down 80 different ideas to these 12 solutions. So I, I feel I feel good where we are, CBI. I feel really good about where the state is. Now it's just making sure that we make these investments. Don't let a year go by and not make these investments. Let's make these investments, grow the economy, and next year come up with another set of solutions. But yeah, I'm, I'm feeling good, and I appreciate all the support people have given CBI. I appreciate the kind words that you've given us, and uh, and we'll continue to, to – we're always open for ideas, open for solutions. We need the business community. You know, if I could – one pledge, one plea. <laughs> plea, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, we've got the legislators signed up. You know, We talk to the governor all the time and his staff. We need the business community to sign on to the pledge. We need the business community to call their legislators, text their legislators, email. We'll, we'll create the email for you all. Reach out to us, though, but they need to hear from the business community that these things are important to them as well. Don't just tell us at CBIA. Don't just tell Ari on his podcast. We need to contact your legislators. I had a legislator tell me that if they get three calls or three emails on an issue, it's a big issue in their mind. That's how few people contact their legislators here in Connecticut. If our businesses can do that, we're going to get some of this stuff through, and it's really going to help our economy. Listen, yeah, you got to make your you got to make your voice heard. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you one more question here. You told me right when you started this job that one of your goals was that if you went to a PTO meeting, that they might be talking about or would be connecting to the issues that CBIA was talking about. Do you think that you've hit that? We're close. Yeah, I get invited to some really interesting meetings now, <laughs> which is why I have no voice. Um, <laughs> Listen, I wasn't going to bring up the, uh, for anyone who hasn't heard Chris before, this is not the normal Christy normal Pentima Chris voice. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and it is not because we tapped into this bottle of gin that yeah, Colin Cooper I mean, gave oh, that, you um, about nine months ago, even though we've seen each other about 15 or 20 times since then, and I have not been able to get this bottle of gin in your hand that this is from Colin Cooper, our former chief manufacturing officer. But yes, this is not my normal voice. Uh, we, we're really lucky that a, a lot of different folks have invited us in to talk like you are today about where we think the economy is going. Where is the economy? What are our solutions? And while a PTO organization has invited me in, I'm, I'm open. Anyone who wants to, <laughs> who wants to let us know. Uh, we've had- Your second plug of the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My second <laughs> ask, right? Um, I do talk to a lot of parents at basketball games and uh, and, and wherever Bella's playing our sports, but, um, but we've been invited to talk to realtors, the chambers across the state. Obviously, that's a uh, a natural fit, um, but a wide variety of organizations about you know what we're doing and how we're you know going to move the state forward, and it's been great. The more folks we talk to, then we hear what they're thinking and maybe what their suggestions are as well, and that's when you get that collaboration. Listen, man, you know talking about housing, talking about student loan forgiveness, which we didn't really get into, but I know it's one of the things. I mean, those are kitchen table items that IPTO could uh, invite you to come talk about or a, or a student group. So uh, that's great, and I really appreciate you transporting this uh, bottle of gin for me. You've been bringing it around for like seven months at yeah. this point, uh, which I which I super appreciate. And if anybody's looking for a nice bottle of gin, I recommend getting invited to go to Colin's house because he'll that's, feed you and gift you, yeah, apparently. Really, yeah. And the it's, most impressive feat, just so you know, is that I did not drink it uh, in those <laughs> period of time. I have my own bottle that I went through, but I did not drink your bottle. I thought about it several times. Yes. Yeah, so well, that's why he wrapped it, I think, is I to did, make yeah. sure it made it uh, in, in one shape. Chris, it's, uh, as always, just awesome, uh, awesome having you on. I think the CBI is lucky to have you. The state's lucky to have you to keep kind of driving this thing forward. Uh, we'll be here to support and uh, and a, a, of one of the groups that gives you uh, unsolicited continual feedback. I know I'm in that I'm in that group, and certainly appreciate you listening to it. Thanks for spending your time and sharing your views with the audience and kind of what you're doing to grow Connecticut. No, thanks for having me. Happy New Year to everybody, and uh, you know, best wishes for a healthy, happy, and our manufacturer is a very successful 2023, and we, we can't do it without all of you. So thanks for the support. Made in America with Ari Santiago is brought to you by Compass MSP. Thanks for listening and spending some time with me today. My goal is to help build a strong manufacturing community, and it would be impossible to do without all of you.